As Jesus went throughout the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord for the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these, first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and, his jo and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Those 12 Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I am sending you out as a sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child. The children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved." When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. For what I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear for him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Thank you so much, Anne. So this week's lesson is called, The Kingdom of Heaven is at Hand. And I would venture that most people, they don't often use the word kingdom unless they're talking about a certain theme park down in Orlando. Many years ago, after an epic Super Bowl win, the MVP was asked, what are you going to do next? And he shouted, I'm going to Disney World. Maybe you remember that. The only topper he could imagine after the victory was to a trip to the Magic Kingdom. A dream destination, Disney is unofficially known as the happiest place on Earth. Well, today we're talking about another kingdom entirely, one that is so much more, one that is infinitely better. While Disney is out of reach for many, the kingdom of heaven has its doors wide open, and the great king wants to involve us 
as he brings people in. Last week, Ellen taught about how the miraculous healings, they identify Jesus as the Messiah. And today we're going to examine another aspect of Jesus' identity that is so prevalent in the book of Matthew, and that is Jesus as king. Matthew wants his Jewish audience to know, without a doubt, this is the Messiah king. The Jewish leaders were anticipating a ruler, and they thought he would come and bring military success to Israel, a political hero that would come triumphant and full of splendor, that would overthrow the Roman Empire and free them from oppression once again. They did not expect a helpless newborn who would be born in a manger. But right from the beginning of Matthew, right from the start, Matthew is building his case that Jesus, born of a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is the king that they have been waiting for. His royalty is highlighted in the genealogy of Matthew 1. In Matthew 2, we have um, the Magi coming to see the king of the Jews and worship him. Throughout his gospel, Matthew tells us the king has come and he has arrived. And then Matthew teaches his readers what it means to be kingdom people. And that's actually the emphasis of Matthew 5 and 6 and 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus begins this most famous discourse with explaining who will enter his kingdom. In Matthew 5 verse 2, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And this kingdom of kingdom living, it appears over and over again. And you don't need to write these down or anything, but you know, have your Bible open, because that's helpful. In chapter 5, 19 to 20, Jesus describes who will be the greatest and least in the kingdom. In 6, chapter 10, or chapter 6, verse 10, is the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Or 6.33, seek first the kingdom. 7.21 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. And the list goes on. Matthew uses this phrase, the kingdom of heaven, 32 times in his book. But what does the kingdom of heaven really mean? That's a good question because it's such a broad term and there's so many facets to it. And it's going to come up and pop up again in Matthew. The other gospel writers, Mark and Luke and John, they use a different phrase. They use the kingdom of God, but it actually means the same thing. Now, devout Jews, um, they would refrain from using God's name. So Matthew uses this phrase, kingdom of heaven, instead of kingdom of God. And he, so he chose slightly different wording to be sensitive to his audience. But more importantly, calling it the kingdom of heaven indicates something significant about its nature. It's not of this world, as the Jews would have predicted. Its aims are spiritual. John the Baptist, when he preached in Matthew 3, he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he called the people to repent, to be baptized, to be cleansed from their sin. And each one of these things that relates to our relationship with God. When Jesus began his public ministry, a chapter later in chapter 4, he declared the same message. He said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You'll notice in our passage, the 12 disciples, they're going to preach that same sermon. And they will share the gospel, inviting others to be saved into the eternal kingdom. And becoming a citizen of the kingdom, it means bowing down to Jesus and embracing him and his rule in every area of your life. It means giving him dominion over all that you have and all that you are. Of course, it wouldn't make sense at all to declare that someone is worthy of kingship and then to deny him the powers inherent with that position. So the kingdom of heaven is Jesus reigning on the throne of our hearts where he ought to be, and you and I responding to that with joyful, thankful obedience and service to him. And having Christ dwelling on the inside, that will manifest with um, Christ-like characters and at Christ-like character and attitude and actions on the outside. With him in control of our lives, we will seek his kingdom first. And we will pray, his kingdom come, my kingdom go. We'll begin to lift our gaze from earthly treasures and begin to prize what is eternal. Some people have called it the upside-down kingdom because everything seems to be opposite to what we've been culturally trained to expect or to desire or value. Popularity, riches, fame, possessions, those are no longer the driving force for kingdom people. So the kingdom is spiritual, 
and its realm is in the hearts of those who follow him, at least for now. A second aspect of the kingdom that we want to just highlight today is this aspect of timing. The message the kingdom of God is at hand, or other versions might say is near, announces it has started. And the miracles we talked about last week, those are an inbreaking of the kingdom. As Jesus demonstrates his authority over sickness, over death, and over the created world. These fantastic events that we discussed last week, they're a foretaste of the future. Jesus' kingdom began in the Gospels, and it continues in our present age. However, the kingdom has not yet been fully realized. We know that Jesus is the earth's creator. We know he is the ultimate ruler. The Bible teaches us that. But he does not presently exercise his full divine rule over the whole earth. He rules in the hearts of the people who follow him. But as we look around in the rest of the world, we do see that everything and everyone has not submitted to Christ yet. Although Jesus died and rose again victorious, we still face evil and sin and fallenness. But we remember that he has promised to return and that he will restore all things. It will be better than Eden one day. But in the meantime, as Christians, we find ourselves between the first and the second coming. We live in this period where the kingdom is both now and it is not yet. The kingdom has come and the kingdom will come. We enjoy a measure of peace and joy, and we have union with Christ in the now, but our experience is partial. It is not perfected. We're still waiting. We anticipate what is to come in the not yet, when the kingdom of heaven is accomplished in its fullness, and he will wipe every tear from every eye, and the time will come when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So the kingdom of heaven is both now and not yet. The kingdom is spiritual, and the kingdom is for sharing. And the fact the kingdom is for sharing, that's actually the focus of our message, but we couldn't really start there. Um, I figured that we need to explain what the kingdom is and to have some grasp of it before we can begin to proclaim it. And hopefully we have a little bit of grounding in that now. So let's jump into our passage. We're in Matthew, uh, the middle of Matthew 9 to the middle of Matthew 10. So we find Jesus motivated by compassion. He's moving through the towns, declaring the gospel of the kingdom and healing the people. And notice he does it in that order. The spiritual is primary. His, um, the souls of the people are his greatest concern and the healings are secondary. They function as a physical demonstration of how Jesus brings health and wholeness, restoring the afflicted. And then in verse 37, Jesus tells his crew some famous words, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. At this point, the disciples have been traveling around with Jesus. They've been listening to all his teaching, but that's pretty much it. They haven't done much yet. And Jesus asks them in these verses to pray for workers. He knows that there are many who are ready to receive the message of the kingdom, but first someone must share it with them. I find it interesting, actually, in chapter 9, Jesus asks them to pray, and then just a few short verses later, he sends them out. And I don't get the impression he would put up a sign-up sheet asking for volunteers, but as Jesus is their king, they want to extend his kingdom. They're more than willing to go and do this. And this event that we have here, it signifies a new phase in Jesus' ministry as he grants the disciples authority to further the mission. And throughout Matthew, we see a progression that happens as the work is multiplied and the work is spreading. And more people are enlisted to serve Jesus and bring others into the kingdom. And this progression, it culminates in Matthew 28 at the end with the Great Commission, when all believers are called to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. But for starters, um, we have 12 men who represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Initially, they're to direct their efforts toward the lost sheep of Israel. But these 12 men, they will later form the foundation for the early church that will include both Jew and Gentile. So for us, 2,000 years later, we need to remember that Jesus is still building his church. 
there are still many lost around us who need to know the shepherd, who need to hear the good news. The harvest is still plentiful, and the workers are still few. Kingdom workers are needed. We are called to pray for kingdom workers. But like the disciples, we are invited to be kingdom workers too. That does not mean that we all need to get on a plane to go to some distant country or work um, in a church or volunteer for a local mission organization. Those are all good things, and for some, that may be exactly the kingdom work that God has prepared for you. But for most, being a kingdom worker is giving gospel testimony with word and deed wherever God has placed you. Who are the unbelievers in your sphere? It could be maybe within your own family or your neighborhood, people at your office or in the retirement home where you live. It is the Lord's harvest and he will save people. That's not our job. Uh, we can't do that part. But as citizens of the kingdom, we're to be invested in kingdom work. Actively giving gospel testimony with word and with deed wherever God has placed us. We're called to be faithful and available, freely sharing what God has done and then leaving the results up to him. So the disciples are called to preach the truth and that is essential for people to come to faith. Um, there's a quote that has been around for years, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Well, that's actually not scriptural at all. Yes, our lives need to bear witness to the truth that we're proclaiming, but no one is one to Christ by simply observing somebody else's exemplary lifestyle and conduct. It may cause them to ask questions, and hopefully it does. It may cause them to be curious, but words are always required for saving faith. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So we need to declare truth about who Jesus is verbally. We need to speak openly when we have opportunity, and we need to demonstrate the truth about who Jesus is practically within our lives. So a godly life, it does need explanation. And gospel speech needs authentication. We need both words and deeds to witness. And so did the disciples actually in Matthew 10. Jesus gives specific instructions for them about this immediate mission. So we find that in verses five to 15. They're told to preach about the kingdom. That's the priority. And Jesus also gives them authority to heal. But notice they're also to live out kingdom values in their interactions with others. Since they have received by grace, the disciples are to give without asking anything in return. We see that in verse eight. They're not to profit from the gospel. Now, I don't think that's a big concern for most of us. We're not really lining our pockets or, or amassing great wealth through evangelism. But unfortunately, it is an issue in the greater um, Christian world. We see organizations and individuals that want to monetize for themselves what Christ has paid for and freely offers. And we need to be watching for this. We need to be on our guard against this. Um, especially as we give toward different ministries or we're listening to pastors or Bible teachers, especially online. If we see this tendency at all, um, that's a major red flag that something's not right here and that this person or this ministry, they have forgotten their king and they're busy building their own kingdom. So the disciples are not to acquire gold or silver or copper on the trip and they're told not to load up with possessions before departing. They're to travel lightly. They're to be unencumbered by things. The disciples need not worry about making sure they have enough money or clothes or food because as verse 10 says, a laborer deserves his wages. Jesus assures them they will be provided for. They do not know in advance how that's gonna happen, but as they go, they're to rely on the Lord that he will meet their needs. Seeking first his kingdom, they're to trust all these things will be added when necessary. The disciples are not just given the message of the kingdom to deliver, but they are called to embody the message with their attitudes and their actions. And we are actually called to do the same. Our witnessing to others will involve word and deed. So we need to ask ourselves, do the principles of the kingdom that are taught throughout the book of Matthew, do they govern the landscape of my life? 
Are these kingdom values that Jesus calls the disciples to in Matthew 10, are they evident in my own priorities? I've been examining my own heart and asking myself some tough questions. Maybe you need to ask them too. When I come to the God of grace, is it about personal gain? Am I approaching him with a laundry list of self-centered requests? Or am I approaching him in awe and in worship as my king? And am I bringing the needs of others and praying for gospel opportunities? Now, of course, we can still pray for our own personal needs and we can bring those before the Lord. I'm not saying that. But we need to ask ourselves, is the focus of my prayer life the advance of his kingdom or my own comfort? Or what about my stuff? What about your stuff? Apparently, the average American home, and Canadians are probably similar, has 300,000 different items in it from salad forks to sofas. And that's a lot of stuff. And the acquisition of those things, even if you're getting them on Kijiji, it still takes money to buy them, it takes time to find and purchase them and pick them up, and energy to maintain and organize all those things. We live in a consumer culture where the drive to accumulate or upgrade, it confronts us at every turn. And we need to pause and ask, Am I weighed down on this spiritual journey by material things? Am I less effective or active in kingdom work because I'm preoccupied with getting and having lots of really nice stuff? What about worry and fear when the Lord calls me to go somewhere or serve him in a new way? Do I step out in faith, depending on him to provide? Or do I try to personally control and orchestrate everything, striving and stressing and self-reliance? In all of these things, it does come down to who is on the throne of my life and who is on the throne of yours. Kingdom workers are needed, people who will proclaim the gospel of the kingdom and live out its principles. And of course, we're never going to do this perfectly. Of course, we're not. Yet Jesus desires to use us in this. And he equips us for this because the kingdom is for sharing and the harvest is plentiful even today. But as our passage continues, Jesus prepares his disciples for the coming difficulties. The truth is that persecution awaits kingdom workers. The disciples are informed that some will reject their message. And Jesus promises those who reject it, they will face judgment one day. And then in verse 16, Jesus moves from the specific instructions he's giving them for their current trip, and he looks forward to the future of ministry. He warns them that they are being sent out as sheep among wolves. It's not a comforting image. The opposition will be intense. It will include flogging and arrest, incarceration, even death. And the perpetrators, they will come from every segment of society, whether that's religious leaders or government officials, royalty, their own families. Jesus tells them, you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, verse 18. You will be hated uh, by all for my name's sake, verse 22. The disciples will be attacked because of their stand for Christ. Notice it is not for being for or against some moral or political cause that's going to put them in hot water. It is the truth of the gospel and their determination to preach it. That will make them objects of scorn. And Jesus reminds them in verse 24, the disciple is not above his teacher. As Jesus himself was maligned and persecuted in bringing salvation to the world, his followers should expect the same. And Jesus' warning here in Matthew 2, it points forward to events that transpire within the early church. In Acts chapter 5, verses 40 and 42, Peter and the other apostles are arrested for preaching the gospel. They're brought before the authorities who beat them and charge them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then let them go. And then in verse 41, they, Peter and the apostles, left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Christ. Did you catch that? The apostles rejoiced and were thankful to be counted worthy of suffering for the name of Jesus. It was a privilege to them to endure this for Christ, considering all that he had endured for them. 
And despite physical punishment, despite being prohibited to speak about Jesus, they continued day after day. I put a map up on the screen, hopefully that'll come up the slide. And this was taken from the Voice of the Martyrs website. Voice of the Martyrs is an organization that promotes the cause of persecuted Christians worldwide. According to their website, in these countries, there are certain ones that are highlighted, Christians encounter varying degrees of repetitive, persistent, and systematic suffering and deprival of basic human rights. Because of their faith in Jesus Christ, a belief that persecutors will not tolerate. And yet the Christians in these countries, they press on. And the map, unfortunately, is not up there right now, but um, you see most of the Middle East, a lot of Africa, um, but our country, Canada, is not highlighted, and neither are our neighbors to the south. And we can be really thankful for that, right? We live in a country where we can gather publicly on a Sunday morning, and we can say the name of Jesus openly. We can post Bible verses on social media. We're free to believe, and by God's grace, we are free to speak. What we say may not be very popular, but we are still free to say it in most contexts. In present-day Ottawa, we're in pretty good shape compared to other Christians, but the landscape is shifting by degrees. It is becoming more challenging to speak for Christ in the public square. If you're a Christian teacher in the public high school or a Christian professor at a secular university, if you're a Christian family doctor, a Christian politician, you probably have noticed this already. Regarding issues like abortion, euthanasia, sexual ethics, the Orthodox Christian view is at odds with our atheistic culture. And up until recently, the Christian perspective had been viewed as old-fashioned, but basically harmless, morally restrictive perhaps, but only a problem for those who actually subscribe to it. That is no longer the case. There is now a concerted effort by certain groups to remove biblical values from any place of influence. Christians can be seen as naive or close-minded, even by some as hateful and oppressive. And we are often portrayed negatively in the media. And unfortunately, the behavior of some have contributed to that stereotype. Not everyone will respond favorably to the gospel or to Christians generally. You or I may be harassed by coworkers or we may be alienated by family members. We may be excluded from social gatherings or denied a promotion at work. For some listening to this message, actually your conversion meant that you couldn't return to your home country again. Yes, the world is becoming more hostile to the Christian message. That's true. But there are still so many opportunities for us to witness. Each one of us has unbelievers nearby who need to hear the gospel in a gracious, winsome, and compelling way. In our passage, Jesus tells the disciples to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Now, be wise, it can be translated as be prudent um, or be shrewd. Jesus wants his disciples to know that there are dangers out there, and he coach, but he coaches them not to carelessly draw abuse. There are times to speak out and there are times to hold back depending on the circumstances. He also tells them to behave innocently in their interactions so their testimony won't be marred by any accusations of wrongdoing. But even as sheep among wolves, they are still to speak because you don't know who is listening and you don't know what the Lord will do. I was speaking to someone the other day and she was telling me the story about how her mom came to faith. Her mother had just moved and had a new baby and was just feeling really anxious and really overwhelmed. And she was soon befriended by a Christian woman. And they got to know one another. And when this young mom was sharing um, what she was struggling with, the other one wrote down some Bible verses for her and gave them to her. She was so comforted by them that she started to read the Bible on her own. And then she started to pray. And the mom started to go to church. And the whole family was saved. And actually, the young woman who told me the story, the daughter, as actually her daughter, um, she's presently serving in full-time ministry. What a bountiful harvest from a small act of obedience. There are lots of ways that we can witness to those around us. The wife of an employee at my husband's company was very ill a few years ago, and when he told Jonathan about the situation, John said, well, you know, my family will pray for your wife's health. Well, of course, COVID happened. He didn't see the guy for months and months. 
Anyway, they recently crossed paths again for the first time, and the first thing out of this man's mouth was to say to my husband, your prayers worked. My wife is all better now. Jonathan offering to pray and then doing so had a significant impact on this man. We can offer to pray for others, but we can also pray with others. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity when somebody shares a hard situation to be able to say, can I pray for you right now? Most people don't say no. Some, some do. I had a vehement no recently when I offered to pray with somebody, um, but that's okay. Most of the time they say yes. And then you or I have the opportunity to bring that person um, with us as we present their need to the God who loves them. There are other evangelistic means available to us as well, right? We can invite friends to come to church with us for Christmas or Easter or any other service. We can offer to bring their kids to VBC or to March break camp. Often my first thought when I ask someone is, there's no way they're going to say yes. But then they do. They really do. And it's so exciting to be part of kingdom work. Despite the current climate, it is not a time for Christians to retreat or to be silent. Jesus warned the disciples that persecution would come. The message of the gospel is offensive to some. But at the same time, there are so many whom he is preparing, many who are waiting to receive the word of life. In a world of uncertainty, aren't you so thankful that you belong to the king? And we want to help others to find the hope and the joy of his kingdom. So the kingdom is for sharing, and gospel workers are needed we should expect persecution. It's not easy. And third point, God takes, takes care of his kingdom workers. He has your back. As Jesus commissions his disciples to embark on this scary task, he also provides words of comfort to them. In verses 26 to 33 of chapter 10, he tells the disciples, have no fear. Do not fear and fear not. Three separate times in seven verses. Jesus understands their humanness. He knows they feel afraid, but he advises them, do not fear those who can kill the body and cannot kill the soul, because Jesus' kingdom is spiritual, and the physical, this body, it's temporary. Instead, the disciples should fear the Lord, because he is the one who will determine their eternal destiny. Next, Jesus reminds them of how God cares for the birds. And this is an image that he uses in the Sermon on the Mount as well, remember? And he says in our passage, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. Sparrows were considered the least valued type of bird, almost worthless little creatures. And your father cares whether they live or die. And Jesus then says in verse 30, even the very hairs on your head are numbered. That is how intimately your father knows you. Fear not, you are far more valuable than many sparrows. And when you are being harassed or persecuted and don't know how to respond, verse 19 says, the spirit of your father will speak through you. He will give you the words to say. And notice in each one of the in these instances, Jesus uses a loving, familiar term, your father. This is not some distant deity, but he is personal and very near. Do not be afraid to share the gospel of the kingdom because your father sees you. He loves you. He sent Jesus to die for you. He is the keeper of your soul, and he will provide for your needs as you honor him. One last thought on the last few lines of this passage. I find it so interesting that back in Matthew 6, verse 1, Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Jesus warns in Matthew 6 about doing your good deeds before men to receive a benefit from them. And in our passage, it's the opposite. He says, Everyone who acknowledges me for, before men, I will acknowledge. And whoever denies me before men, then I will deny. And that phrase, before men or before others, is used in both instances, but two very contrary instructions. In one, faith is to be cultivated privately, and the other one is about um, emphasizing public expressions. And I think the difference here is the motivation. In Matthew 6, Jesus recognizes the temptation 
to do righteous acts in front of those who would be likely to praise them. In Matthew 10, he recognizes the temptation to be silent and not to acknowledge God because we fear the response. If we're motivated by earthly reward or earthly loss, that will damage our witness before others. At the beginning when we started out, we talked about the magic kingdom. It's apparently the world's top tourist destination. It welcomes more than 58 million viewers per year. But the thing is, they're visitors. Well, they might enjoy a day or two or even a week, they are just passing through. And the momentary pleasure offered by cotton candy and roller coasters, it's quickly forgotten even while the visa bill remains unpaid. But the kingdom of heaven offers joy everlasting. It is a new and forever home paid for in advance by the Lord Jesus, the true king who came and will one day come again. And in the meantime, between the now and the not yet, we can boldly tell others about admission to the happiest place that is so far beyond the things of this earth. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much that you are our Father and you are so near and so present and you care for us. You see us, you know us, Lord. You know our fears about the people that it's scary to share the truth with, but yet we also know that you equip us and it is such a privilege to be involved in kingdom work, in the work that you are doing and drawing people to yourself. Help us, Lord, to be brave in that. Help us, Lord, um, to see the good of that um, and to experience the joy of serving you. Father, I thank you for these women here, and I pray that you would just bless us um, around the tables in our conversations, that they would be honoring to you. In Jesus' name, amen.